Classic Alcoholic Behaviors We all know someone who cannot control his or her drinking, and sometimes after repeated attempts to stop, the alcoholic is successful and can control the urge to drink. The following represents some of the classic alcoholic behaviors in the first stage of alcoholism. According to various reliable sources, the person's drinking is no longer social because it has become a means to escape work-related stress, relationship issues, inhibitions, and life's problems in general. Early into the development of the disease of alcoholism, the person increasingly depends on the feeling that results from drinking. Tolerance for alcohol also gradually increases requiring larger amounts in order to reach the desired level of intoxication. Some of the early, classic alcoholic behaviors are lack of recognition by the person that he or she is in the early stages of alcoholism, as exhibited by frequent drinking of increasing amounts, huge tolerance, boasting, and ability to drink huge amounts of alcohol, and behavioral changes including irritability when unable to drink. Once a conflict surfaces the alcoholic denies there is a problem as he or she begins to experience physical symptoms including stomach upset, vomiting, hand tremors, hangovers, and blackouts. Problems begin to arise in all areas of an alcoholic's life, and instead of facing on the real cause, alcohol, they begin to blame everyone and everything around them. Now the alcoholic is drinking not for stress relief, but because of the dependence. The next disruption is usually marital difficulties, work-related issues, health problems, and financial difficulties. Things that were once of great of importance to the alcoholic are now neglected, aggressive and grandiose alcoholic behaviors prevail, avoidance of family and friends increases, violent or destructive behaviors occur, poor nutritional habits and poor sleep pattern, unreasonable resentments, and increasing physical symptoms. The most profound of the classic alcoholic behaviors occur during the last stage of the disease. Even though the alcoholic may have successfully held down a job, was a functional alcoholic, has now lost all control. Drinking now takes place during the day, starting out with an eye-opener, before work, and progressing throughout the day. The job is lost as the alcoholic has total disregard for everything that they once held sacred, job, family, home, and food take the back seat to drinking. Neurological symptoms are also now present in the form of the shakes, tremors that occur when he or she tries not to drink. When this occurs with hallucinations, it is called the DTs or delirium tremens, which is potentially fatal without medical attention. The cycle usually continues to repeat itself until the alcoholic behaviors persist until the individual has reached the bottom, then recovery may be possible with a strong desire to stop drinking. How alcohol affects the brain. I once had the unusual, though unhappy, opportunity of observing the same phenomenon in the brain structure of a man, who, in a paroxysm of alcoholic excitement, decapitated himself under the wheel of a railway carriage, and whose brain was instantaneously evolved from the skull by the crash. The brain itself, entire, was before me within three minutes after the death. It exhaled the odor of spirit most distinctly, and its membranes and minute structures were vascular in the extreme. It looked as if it had been recently injected with vermilion. The white matter of the cerebrum, studded with red points, could scarcely be distinguished, when it was incised, by its natural whiteness, and the pia mater, or internal vascular membrane covering the brain, resembled a delicate web of coagulated red blood, so tensely were its fine vessels engorged. I should add that this condition extended through both the larger and the smaller brain, the cerebrum and cerebellum, but was not so marked in the medulla or commencing portion of the spinal cord. The spinal cord and nerves. Dash 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 dash. The action of alcohol continued beyond the first stage, the function of the spinal cord is influenced. Through this part of the nervous system we are accustomed, in health, to perform automatic acts of a mechanical kind, which proceed systematically even when we are thinking or speaking on other subjects. Thus a skilled workman will continue his mechanical work perfectly, while his mind is bent on some other subject, and thus we all perform various acts in a purely automatic way, without calling in the aid of the higher centers, except something more than ordinary occurs to demand their service, upon which we think before we perform. Under alcohol, as the spinal centers become influenced, these pure automatic acts cease to be correctly carried on. 
that the hand may reach any object, or the foot be correctly planted, the higher intellectual center must be invoked to make the proceeding secure. There follows quickly upon this a deficient power of coordination of muscular movement. The nervous control of certain of the muscles is lost, and the nervous stimulus is more or less enfeebled. The muscles of the lower lip in the human subject usually fail first of all, then the muscles of the lower limbs, and it is worthy of remark that the extensor muscles give way earlier than the flexors. The muscles themselves, by this time, are also failing in power, they respond more feebly than is natural to the nervous stimulus, they, too, are coming under the depressing influence of the paralyzing agent, their structure is temporarily deranged, and their contractile power reduced. This modification of the animal functions under alcohol, marks the second degree of its action. In young subjects, there is now, usually, vomiting with faintness, followed by gradual relief from the burden of the poison. Effect on the brain centers. Dash 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 dash. The alcoholic spirit carried yet a further degree, the cerebral or brain centers become influenced, they are reduced in power, and the controlling influences of will and of judgment are lost. As these centers are unbalanced and thrown into chaos, the rational part of the nature of the man gives way before the emotional, passional or organic part. The reason is now off duty, or is fooling with duty, and all the mere animal instincts and sentiments are laid atrociously bare. The coward shows up more craven, the braggart more boastful, the cruel more merciless, the untruthful more false, the carnal more degraded. In Vino Veritas, expresses, even, indeed, to physiological accuracy, the true condition. The reason, the emotions, the instincts, are all in a state of carnival, and in chaotic feebleness. Finally, the action of the alcohol still extending, the superior brain centers are overpowered, the senses are beclouded, the voluntary muscular prostration is perfected, sensibility is lost, and the body lies a mere log, dead by all but one-fourth, on which alone its life hangs. The heart still remains true to its duty, and while it just lives it feeds the breathing power. And so the circulation and the respiration, in the otherwise inert mass, keeps the mass within the bare domain of life until the poison begins to pass away and the nervous centers to revive again. It is happy for the inebriate that, as a rule, the brain fails so long before the heart that he has neither the power nor the sense to continue his process of destruction up to the act of death of his circulation. Therefore he lives to die another day. Effect of Alcohol on the Blood Dr. Richardson, in his lectures on alcohol, given both in England and America, speaking of the action of this substance on the blood after passing from the stomach, says. Suppose, then, a certain measure of alcohol be taken into the stomach, it will be absorbed there, but previous to absorption, it will have to undergo a proper degree of dilution with water, for there is this peculiarity respecting alcohol when it is separated by an animal membrane from a watery fluid like the blood, that it will not pass through the membrane until it has become charged, to a given point of dilution, with water. It is itself, in fact, so greedy for water, it will pick it up from watery textures, and deprive them of it until, by its saturation, its power of reception is exhausted, after which it will diffuse into the current of circulating fluid. It is this power of absorbing water from every texture with which alcoholic spirits comes in contact, that creates the burning thirst of those who freely indulge in its use. Its effect, when it reaches the circulation, is thus described by Dr. Richardson. As it passes through the circulation of the lungs it is exposed to the air, and some little of it, raised into vapor by the natural heat, is thrown off in expiration. If the quantity of it be large, this loss may be considerable, and the odor of the spirit may be detected in the expired breath. If the quantity be small, the loss will be comparatively little, as the spirit will be held in solution by the water in the blood. After it has passed through the lungs, and has been driven by the left heart over the arterial circuit, it passes into what is called the minute circulation, or the structural circulation of the organism. The arteries here extend into very small vessels, which are called arterioles, and from these infinitely small vessels spring the equally minute radicals or roots of the veins, which are ultimately to become the great rivers bearing the blood back to the heart. In its passage through this minute circulation the alcohol finds its way to every organ, to this brain, to these muscles, to these secreting or excreting organs, nay, even into this bony structure itself, it moves with the blood. 
In some of these parts which are not excreting, it remains for a time diffused, and in those parts where there is a large percentage of water, it remains longer than in other parts. From some organs which have an open tube for conveying fluids away, as the liver and kidneys, it is thrown out or eliminated, and in this way a portion of it is ultimately removed from the body. The rest passing round and round with the circulation, is probably decomposed and carried off in new forms of matter. When we know the course which the alcohol takes in its passage through the body, from the period of its absorption to that of its elimination, we are the better able to judge what physical changes it induces in the different organs and structures with which it comes in contact. It first reaches the blood, but, as a rule, the quantity of it that enters is insufficient to produce any material effect on that fluid. If, however, the dose taken be poisonous or semi-poisonous, then even the blood, rich as it is in water and it contains 790 parts in a thousand is affected. The alcohol is diffused through this water, and there it comes in contact with the other constituent parts, with the fibrin, that plastic substance which, when blood is drawn, clots and coagulates, and which is present in the proportion of from 2 to 3 parts in a thousand, with the albumin which exists in the proportion of 70 parts, with the salts which yield about 10 parts, with the fatty matters, and lastly, with those minute, round bodies which float in myriads in the blood, which were discovered by the Dutch philosopher, Leeuwenhoek, as one of the first results results of microscopical observation, about the middle of the 17th century, and which are called the blood globules or corpuscles. These last named bodies are, in fact, cells, their discs, when natural, have a smooth outline, they are depressed in the center, and they are red in color, the color of the blood being derived from them. We have discovered that there exist other corpuscles or cells in the blood in much smaller quantity, which are called white cells, and these different cells float in the blood stream within the vessels. The red take the center of the stream, the white lie externally near the sides of the vessels, moving less quickly. Our business is mainly with the red corpuscles. They perform the most important functions in the economy, they absorb, in great part, the oxygen which we inhale in breathing, and carry it to the extreme tissues of the body, they absorb, in great part, the carbonic acid gas which is produced in the combustion of the body in the extreme tissues, and bring that gas back to the lungs to be exchanged for oxygen there, in short, they are the vital instruments of the circulation. With all these parts of the blood, with the water, fibrin, albumin, salts, fatty matter and corpuscles, the alcohol comes in contact when it enters the blood, and, if it be in sufficient quantity, it produces disturbing action. I have watched this disturbance very carefully on the blood corpuscles, for, in some animals we can see these floating along during life, and we can also observe them from men who are under the effects of alcohol, by removing a speck of blood, and examining it with the microscope. The action of the alcohol, when it is observable, is varied. It may cause the corpuscles to run too closely together, and to adhere in rolls, it may modify their outline, making the clear defined, smooth outer edge irregular or crenate, or even star-like, it may change the round corpuscle into the oval form, or, in very extreme cases, it may produce what I may call a truncated form of corpuscles, in which the change is so great that if we did not trace it through all its stages, we should be puzzled to know whether the object looked at were indeed a blood cell. All these changes are due to the action of the spirit upon the water contained in the corpuscles, upon the capacity of the spirit to extract water from them. During every stage of modification of corpuscles thus described, their function to absorb and fix gases is impaired, and when the aggregation of the cells, in masses, is great, other difficulties arise, for the cells, united together, pass less easily than they should through the minute vessels of the lungs and of the general circulation, and impede the current, by which local injury is produced. A further action upon the blood, instituted by alcohol in excess, is upon the fibrin or the plastic colloidal matter. On this the spirit may act in two different ways, according to the degree in which it affects the water that holds the fibrin in solution. It may fix the water with the fibrin, and thus destroy the power of coagulation, or it may extract the water so determinately as to produce coagulation. How alcohol causes mental and moral changes. The transforming power or alcohol is marvelous, and often appalling. It seems to open a way of entrance into the soul for all classes of foolish, insane or malignant spirits, who, so long as it remains in contact with the brain, are able to hold possession. Men of the kindest nature when sober, act often like fiends when drunk. 
crimes and outrages are committed, which shock and shame the perpetrators when the excitement of inebriation has passed away. Referring to this subject, Dr. Henry Munro says. It appears from the experience of Mr. Fletcher, who has paid much attention to the cases of drunkards, from the remarks of Mr. Dunn, in his, medical psychology, and from observations of my own, that there is some analogy between our physical and psychical natures, for, as the physical part of us, when its power is at a low ebb, becomes susceptible of morbid influences which, in full vigor, would pass over it without effect. So when the psychical, synonymous with the moral, part of the brain has its healthy function disturbed and deranged by the introduction of a morbid poison like alcohol, the individual so circumstanced sinks in depravity, and, becomes the helpless subject of the forces of evil, which are powerless against a nature free from the morbid influences of alcohol. Different persons are affected in different ways by the same poison. Indulgence in alcoholic drinks may act upon one or more of the cerebral organs, and, as its necessary consequence, the manifestations of functional disturbance will follow in such of the mental powers as these organs subserve. If the indulgence be continued, then, either from deranged nutrition or organic lesion, manifestations formerly developed only during a fit of intoxication may become permanent, and terminate in insanity or dipsomania. M. Florenz first pointed out the fact that certain morbific agents, when introduced into the current of the circulation, tend to act primarily and specially on one nervous center in preference to that of another, by virtue of some special elective affinity between such morbific agents and certain ganglia. Thus, in the tottering gait of the tipsy man, we see the influence of alcohol upon the functions of the cerebellum in the impairment of its power of co-ordinating the muscles. Certain writers on diseases of the mind make a special allusion to that form of insanity termed dipsomania, in which a person has an unquenchable thirst for alcoholic drinks a tendency as decidedly maniacal as that of homicidal mania, or the uncontrollable desire to burn, termed pyromania, or to steal, called kleptomania. Homicidal mania. Dash 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 dash. The different tendencies of homicidal mania in different individuals are often only nursed into action when the current of the blood has been poisoned with alcohol. I had a case of a person who, whenever his brain was so excited, told me that he experienced a most uncontrollable desire to kill or injure someone, so much so, that he could at times hardly restrain himself from the action, and was obliged to refrain from all stimulants, lest, in an unlucky moment, he might commit himself. Townley, who murdered the young lady of his affections, for which he was sentenced to be imprisoned in a lunatic asylum for life, poisoned his brain with brandy and soda water before he committed the rash act. The brandy stimulated into action certain portions of the brain, which acquired such a power as to subjugate his will, and hurry him to the performance of a frightful deed, opposed alike to his better judgment and his ordinary desires. As to pyromania, some years ago I knew a laboring man in a country village, who, whenever he had had a few glasses of ale at the public house, would chuckle with delight at the thought of firing certain gentlemen's stacks. Yet, when his brain was free from the poison, a quieter, better disposed man could not be. Unfortunately, he became addicted to habits of intoxication, and, one night, under alcoholic excitement, fired some stacks belonging to his employers, for which, he was sentenced for 15 years to a penal settlement, where his brain would never again be alcoholically excited. Kleptomania. Dash 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 dash. Next, I will give an example of kleptomania. I knew, many years ago, a very clever, industrious and talented young man, who told me that whenever he had been drinking, he could hardly withstand, the temptation of stealing anything that came in his way, but that these feelings never troubled him at other times. One afternoon, after he had been indulging with his fellow workmen in drink, his will, unfortunately, was overpowered, and he took from the mansion where he was working some articles of worth, for which he was accused, and afterwards sentenced to a term of imprisonment. When set at liberty he had the good fortune to be placed among some kind-hearted persons, vulgarly called teetotalers, and, from conscientious motives, signed the pledge, now above twenty years ago. From that time to the present moment he has never experienced the overmastering desire which so often beset him in his drinking days to take that which was not his own. Moreover, no pretext on earth could now entice him to taste of any liquor containing alcohol, feeling that, under its influence, he might again fall its victim. He holds an influential position in the town where he resides. 
I have known some ladies of good position in society, who, after a dinner or supper party, and after having taken sundry glasses of wine, could not withstand the temptation of taking home any little article not their own, when the opportunity offered, and who, in their sober moments, have returned them, as if taken by mistake. We have many instances recorded in our police reports of gentlemen of position, under the influence of drink, committing thefts of the most paltry articles, afterwards returned to the owners by their friends, which can only be accounted for, psychologically, by the fact that the will had been for the time completely overpowered by the subtle influence of alcohol. Loss of mental clearness. Dash 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 Alcohol, whether taken in large or small doses, immediately disturbs the natural functions of the mind and body, is now conceded by the most eminent physiologists. Dr. Brinton says, mental acuteness, accuracy of conception, and delicacy of the senses, are all so far opposed by the action of alcohol, as that the maximum efforts of each are incompatible with the ingestion of any moderate quantity of fermented liquid. Indeed, there is scarcely any calling which demands skillful and exact effort of mind and body, or which requires the balanced exercise of many faculties, that does not illustrate this rule. The mathematician, the gambler, the metaphysician, the billiard player, the author, the artist, the physician, would, if they could analyze their experience aright, generally concur in the statement, that a single glass will often suffice to take, so to speak, the edge off both mind and body, and to reduce their capacity to something below what is relatively their perfection of work. A train was driven carelessly into one of the principal London stations, running into another train, killing, by the collision, six or seven persons, and injuring many others. From the evidence at the inquest, it appeared that the guard was reckoned sober, only he had had two glasses of ale with a friend at a previous station. Now, reasoning psychologically, these two glasses of ale had probably been instrumental in taking off the edge from his perceptions and prudence, and producing a carelessness or boldness of action which would not have occurred under the cooling, temperate influence of a beverage free from alcohol. Many persons have admitted to me that they were not the same after taking even one glass of ale or wine that they were before, and could not thoroughly trust themselves after they had taken this single glass. Impairment of memory. Dash 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 An impairment of the memory is among the early symptoms of alcoholic derangement. This, says Dr. Richardson, extends even to forgetfulness of the commonest things, to names of familiar persons, to dates, to duties of daily life. Strangely, too, he adds, this failure, like that which indicates, in the aged, the era of second childishness and mere oblivion, does not extend to the things of the past, but is confined to events that are passing. On old memories the mind retains its power, on new ones it requires constant prompting and sustainment. In this failure of memory nature gives a solemn warning that imminent peril is at hand. Well for the habitual drinker if he heed the warning. Should he not do so, symptoms of a more serious character will, in time, develop themselves, as the brain becomes more and more diseased, ending, it may be, in permanent insanity. Mental and moral diseases. Dash 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 of the mental and moral diseases which too often follow the regular drinking of alcohol, we have painful records in asylum reports, in medical testimony and in our daily observation and experience. These are so full and varied, and thrust so constantly on our attention, that the wonder is that men are not afraid to run the terrible risks involved even in what is called the moderate use of alcoholic beverages. In 1872, a select committee of the House of Commons, appointed to consider the best plan for the control and management of habitual drunkards, called upon some of the most eminent medical men in Great Britain to give their testimony in answer to a large number of questions, embracing every topic within the range of inquiry, from the pathology of inebriation to the practical usefulness of prohibitory laws. In this testimony much was said about the effect of alcoholic stimulation on the mental condition and moral character. 
One physician, Dr. James Crichton Brown, who, in 10 years' experience as superintendent of lunatic asylums, has paid special attention to the relations of habitual drunkenness to insanity, having carefully examined 500 cases, testified that alcohol, taken in excess, produced different forms of mental disease, of which he mentioned four classes, one, mania apotu, or alcoholic mania, two, the monomania of suspicion, three, chronic alcoholism, characterized by failure of the memory and power of judgment, with partial paralysis generally ending fatally. 4. Dipsomania, or an irresistible craving for alcoholic stimulants, occurring very frequently, paroxysmally, and with constant liability to periodical exacerbations, when the craving becomes altogether uncontrollable. Of this latter form of disease, he says, this is invariably associated with a certain impairment of the intellect, and of the affections and the moral powers. Dr. Alexander Petty, a physician of over 37 years practice in Edinburgh, gave, in his evidence, many remarkable instances of the moral perversions that followed continued drinking. Relation between insanity and drunkenness. Dash 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 Dr. John Nugent said that his experience of 26 years among lunatics led him to believe that there is a very close relation between the results of the abuse of alcohol and insanity. The population of Ireland had decreased, he said, 2 millions in 25 years, but there was the same amount of insanity now that there was before. He attributed this, in a great measure, to indulgence in drink. Dr. Arthur Mitchell, Commissioner of Lunacy for Scotland, testified that the excessive use of alcohol caused a large amount of the lunacy, crime and pauperism of that country. In some men, he said, habitual drinking leads to other diseases than insanity, because the effect is always in the direction of the proclivity, but it is certain that there are many in whom there is a clear proclivity to insanity, who would escape that dreadful consummation but for drinking, excessive drinking in many persons determining the insanity to which they are, at any rate, predisposed. The children of drunkards, he further said, are in a larger proportion idiotic than other children, and in a larger proportion become themselves drunkards, they are also in a larger proportion liable to the ordinary forms of acquired insanity. Dr. Winslow Forbes believed that in the habitual drunkard the whole nervous structure, and the brain especially, became poisoned by alcohol. All the mental symptoms which you see accompanying ordinary intoxication, he remarks, result from the poisonous effects of alcohol on the brain. It is the brain which is mainly affected. In temporary drunkenness, the brain becomes in an abnormal state of alimentation, and if this habit is persisted in for years, the nervous tissue itself becomes permeated with alcohol, and organic changes take place in the nervous tissues of the brain, producing that frightful and dreadful chronic insanity which we see in lunatic asylums, traceable entirely to habits of intoxication. A large percentage of frightful mental and brain disturbances can, he declared, be traced to the drunkenness of parents. Dr. D.G. Dodge, late of the New York State Inebriate Asylum, who, with Dr. Joseph Parrish, gave testimony before the Committee of the House of Commons, said, in one of his answers, with the excessive use of alcohol, functional disorder will invariably appear, and no organ will be more seriously affected, and possibly impaired, than the brain. This is shown in the inebriate by a weakened intellect, a general debility of the mental faculties, a partial or total loss of self-respect, and a departure of the power of self-command, all of which, acting together, place the victim at the mercy of a depraved and morbid appetite, and make him utterly powerless, by his own unaided efforts, to secure his recovery from the disease which is destroying him. And he adds, I am of opinion that there is a great similarity between inebriety and insanity. I am decidedly of opinion that the former has taken its place in the family of diseases as prominently as its twin brother insanity, and, in my opinion, the day is not far distant when the pathology of the former will be as fully understood and as successfully treated as the latter, and even more successfully, since it is more within the reach and bounds of human control, which, wisely exercised and scientifically administered, may prevent curable inebriation from verging into possible incurable insanity. General Impairment of the Faculties 
dash 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 Dr. Richardson, speaking of the action of alcohol on the mind, gives the following sad picture of its ravages. An analysis of the condition of the mind induced and maintained by the free daily use of alcohol as a drink, reveals a singular order of facts. The manifestation fails altogether to reveal the exaltation of any reasoning power in a useful or satisfactory direction. I have never met with an instance in which such a claim for alcohol has been made. On the contrary, confirmed alcoholics constantly say that for this or that work, requiring thought and attention, it is necessary to forego some of the usual potations in order to have a cool head for hard work. On the other side, the experience is overwhelmingly in favor of the observation that the use of alcohol sells the reasoning powers, make weak men and women the easy prey of the wicked and strong, and leads men and women who should know better into every grade of misery and vice. If, then, alcohol enfeebles the reason, what part of the mental constitution does it exalt and excite? It excites and exalts those animal, organic, emotional centers of mind which, in the dual nature of man, so often cross and oppose that pure and abstract reasoning nature which lifts man above the lower animals, and rightly exercised, little lower than the angels. It excites man's worst passions. Dash 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 Exciting these animal centers, it lets loose all the passions, and gives them more or less of unlicensed dominion over the man. It excites anger, and when it does not lead to this extreme, it keeps the mind fretful, irritable, dissatisfied and captious. And if I were to take you through all the passions, love, hate, lust, envy, avarice and pride, I should but show you that alcohol ministers to them all, that, paralyzing the reason, it takes from off these passions that fine adjustment of reason, which places man above the lower animals. From the beginning to the end of its influence it subdues reason and sets the passions free. The analogies, physical and mental, are perfect. That which loosens the tension of the vessels which feed the body with due order and precision, and, thereby, lets loose the heart to violent excess and unbridled motion, loosens, also, the reason and lets loose the passion. In both instances, heart and head are, for a time, out of harmony, their balance broken. The man descends closer and closer to the lower animals. From the angels he glides farther and farther away. A sad and terrible picture. Dash 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 The destructive effects of alcohol on the human mind present, finally, the saddest picture of its influence. The most aesthetic artist can find no angel here. All is animal, an animal of the worst type. Memory irretrievably lost, words and very elements of speech forgotten or words displaced to have no meaning in them. Rage and anger persistent and mischievous, or remittent and impotent. Fear at every corner of life, distrust on every side, grief merged into blank despair, hopelessness into permanent melancholy. Surely no pandemonium that ever poet dreamt of could equal that which would exist if all the drunkards of the world were driven into one mortal sphere. As I have moved among those who are physically stricken with alcohol, and have detected under the various disguises of name the fatal diseases, the pains and penalties it imposes on the body, the picture has been sufficiently cruel. But even that picture pales, as I conjure up, without any stretch of imagination, the devastations which the same agent inflicts on the mind. 40%, the learned superintendent of Colney Hatch, Dr. Shepard, tells us, of those who were brought into that asylum in 1876, were so brought because of the direct or indirect effects of alcohol. If the facts of all the asylums were collected with equal care, the same tale would, I fear, be told. What need we further to show the destructive action on the human mind? The pandemonium of drunkards, the grand transformation scene of that pantomime of drink which commences with, moderation. Let it never more be forgotten by those who love their fellow men until, through their efforts, it is closed forever.